Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Techniques and Best Practices for Cardiomyocyte Isolation. This is Liam Sanyo from Inside Scientific and I'll be your host for today's event. Our session is sponsored by Ion Optics and will feature scientists discussing techniques for isolating myocytes using both traditional and Langdorff free methodologies, including key considerations, best practices, and how to achieve and confirm optimal myocyte quality. First, we'll hear from Dr. Rongli Liao, co-director of the Stanford Amyloid Center and professor of medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine. She will discuss essential apparatus and tools, constant flow and constant pressure perfusion, cannulation, heart dissection, and common applications for isolated myocytes. Following, we will hear from Dr. Davor Pavlovich, lecturer of cardiovascular sciences at the College of Medical and Dental Sciences at University of Birmingham. Dr. Pavlovich will discuss a novel Langendorf free approach to myocyte isolation, including step-by-step -step methodology, validation, and a comparison between the Langendorf and injection methods. Thank you, Liam, for a nice introduction. I'm Rongli Liao from Stanford School of Medicine, and for the next 10-15 minutes, I would like to share with you a couple of methods that my laboratory has been using to produce high and consistent quality of adult cardiomyocyte from mice and rats for our research. In general, either adult rat or mouse cardiomyocyte can be isolated using isolated heart perfusion method with either constant perfusion pressure or constant flow mode. Today, I would like to touch upon both methods and also how to hang and position heart for maximum efficacy. I believe if one understands the theory behind the heart perfusion, it is relatively easy to change the mode of perfusion, either with constant pressure or constant flow, uh, depends on your research needs. Shown here are the essential equipment or tools you need to set up a Lingendorf perfusion system for myocyte isolation. First, you need to find a stable stand and the various clamps in order to set up the system. You will need a water jacket condenser, temperature control water circulator, circulating pump, etc. Silicone antigon tubings and blunt end needles, which I will describe more in detail in the later slides. These are the grocery list of stuff you need to build a perfusion system from scratch. If you don't have some of those laying, laying around in your laboratory, you can easily find it in the company, such like uh, Fisher Scientific or BWR. Specifically, for the constant perfusion pressure mode, since the perfusion pressure is determined by the distance between the heart and the top of the perfusate reservoir. Therefore, to achieve an 80 millimeter mercury perfusion pressure, the surface of your perfusate and the heart should be maintained at a vertical distance of 109 centimeter in order to perfuse the heart at the pressure of 80 millimeter mercury, as shown in this scheme. This can be achieved by pumping the buffer to the reservoir using the same rate of a perfusion float for each heart and using the pump. This distance of a heart from the top of the reservoir can be adjusted accordingly to the intended pressure needed in the particular experimental setting. For constant flow perfusion, this is a bit simpler as the desired flow can be achieved by just regulating the flow rate of the pump. There is one item that is critical for the experiments that one needs to make by themselves. Depends on the size of the heart, i.e. the diameter of the aorta. You need to select different size of the blinds and needles. Typically, for about 200 to 300 gram red, one will need to use 18 gauge pink color blind end needle and 23 gauge needle, a teal green color ones for the mouse heart. 
to prevent the sliding down of the heart from the smooth surface of the metal cannula. We typically using PE tubing to make a jacket that one can slide over the needle. Importantly, using hot plates, one can make a small lift on the end of the tubing and slides it onto the needle. This is a very critical to prevent the heart to slip off the cannula. For 18 gauge needle, PE205 tubing are most appropriate. And for 23 gauge needle, PE50 tubing would be just right. Once you have the system set up ready, you can start to prepare animal to remove hearts. You will need to prepare uh, sharp scissors for cutting the animal skins, muscle and bones, as well as fine scissors for cutting hearts out of animal chest, chest. Also needed are one pair of fine forceps to slide the outer, uh, aortic openings of the heart onto the cannula and the hands it on the operators. You will also need a, a bulldog clamp to hold the heart on the perfusion operators to the bronze end needles with the PE tubing described earlier. This will allow you to tie the suture knot to secure the heart on the can cannula. One should always follow the institution animal care and use committee approved method to sacrifice the animal and to remove the heart while it is beating. Know that it is very important that the animal should be fully anesthetized and remain non-responsive to the pinch before you open the chest and the, remove the heart. You also want to make sure to leave sufficient outer lens in order to tie the heart to securely onto the cannula. At this point, it is very important that your perfusion buffer is slowly drip by drip uh, flow through the cannula as you want to prevent any air bubble entering into the heart while you hang it uh, to the cannula. The secure heart, to secure heart on the cannula, one should use two tweezers to hold each side of the hour tot. And then, then as shown here in the figure, once the heart is onto the cannula, continue using one tweezer to hold the heart and to on the cannula, and use the other hand to grab the bulldog clamp as shown in the slides before to secure the heart onto the cannula. Once it is secure, use appropriate suture to tie the heart onto the blinds and needles. It is very important to know that the position of the cannula in the heart is very critical for the subsequent enzymatic digestion. The perfect position is right before the aortic valve as shown in the graphics pointed by the yellow uh, uh, arrow. This is important to allow the perfusate to enter the coronary artery in order to properly perfuse the heart. I always recommend anyone who is new or first timer to dissect a couple of the hearts and just to be familiar with the anatomy of the heart before you can continue this procedure. And this will help you tremendously to determine the proper position to secure the heart and to easy to put it into the cannula. Following the protocol provided, when the heart becomes very soft to touch, the digestion is completed. Remove the heart from the cannula and immediately put the buffer and that the heart should be very easy to tear apart to into a small pieces. You can use the plastic pipette to pipetting up and down gently to release the cardiac myocyte from the digested heart tissues. After you know that, that the tissue is pretty much digested and you can filter 
the undigested piece of the tissues using the 100 micron cell filters, which fits perfectly well on the 50 cc tubes. The cell was settled down to the tubes, and you can take out the 50 microliter cell suspension to examine under the microscope to see if a greater than 50, greater than 80% of the cell are rod shaped, and then that is a successful isolation. Since the isolation buffer does not contain calcium, the critical next step is to reintroduce calcium back to the isolated cell. For red cardiac myocyte, you can reintroduce the calcium into one step that directly pipette the myocytes, which are settled at the bottom of the tubes and slowly release them to the buffer containing 1.2 millimolar calcium. For adult mouse cardiac myocytes, they are much fragile and sensitive than the adult red cardiac myocytes. So we need to reintroduce the calcium in a stepwise manner, with gradually increasing calcium concentration as shown in the protocol attached. There is also another common method to isolate adult cardiac red myocytes. In this method, heart will be perfused with a similarly to the one I just described, but with a different digestion enzyme. In addition, after set time indicated in the protocol following digestion, the heart will be removed from cannula and to be cut into the small pieces and put into the pickups with a different set of enzymes and put in 37 degree uh, Celsius uh, incubating shaker for additional 20 minutes. During this time, you could check if the digestion is completed by periodically pipetting cell suspension out and exam under the microscope during the shaking process. After the complete digestion is reached, cell can be used for subsequent culture or immediate use for functional assay. The advantage of this preparation is the yield is much higher, so they can be more appropriate for doing the cell culture work than the functional study. In the next couple of minutes, I will briefly touch upon the common use of isolate adult cardiac myocyte in various research projects. While one can isolate cardiac myocyte from all kinds of transgenic or knockout mouse models, one can also overexpress gene of interest using viral infection mediated gene expressions in vivo by injecting adenoviral virus into directly into the heart of adult mouse and the isolate cardiac myocytes one week later. Shown here is the robust GSP, GFP protein expression with a such in vivo infection. The same viral infection can also be applied directly in isolated adult cardiac myocytes in culture. Shown here is our cardiac myocytes infected with adenovirus with a mutant cardiotroponin C gene that identifies from patients with idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. Using commercially available instruments, such as ion optic cell contractility system, one can measure the cellular functions and calcium dynamics at a B2B basis simultaneously, as shown here. And shown here is the example of cell shortening of a controlled cardiac myocyte and the myocyte expressing mutant troponin C. It shows that the reduced contractile function in cell expression mutant troponin C. In addition to a cellular functions, ion optic system also allows simultaneously measures of intracellular calcium dynamic as shown here. There are lots of ways one can think to use this isolated cell for all kinds of in vitro functional assessments at the basal or with any stimulant, drugs or compounds and determine their effects on the excitation contraction coupling. 
there is endless possibility to utilize isolate cardiomyocytes. In addition to functional measurement just mentioned, there is also a list of few examples where one can utilize isolate cardiomyocyte, including but not limited to identify the expression, localization, or co-localization of any protein of interest, determine the effects of a drugs, compound, substrate utilization, as well as morphological or electrophysiological biophysical properties of isolated cardiomyocyte, just to name a few. In summary, Isolated cardiomyocyte is a powerful tool to advance our understanding in cellular, biology, biophysical property, etc. at the single cell level. Moreover, since cardiomyocytes not only can be isolated from animal model, they can also be isolated from explanted human heart. However, it is also important that we provide highest standard and perhaps a consistent protocol and quality control within lab, as well as among laboratories. It is important to compare data that are generated in different laboratories with the same conditions and the same scientific rigor. With this, I will share the working protocol that we have been using in our laboratory, and they will be available for free download. Happy Heart! Happy cell. With this, I would like to thank you for listening, and I can have opportunity to share all those protocol with you. It's ordered to over the years, all the hard work with my fellows and students, as well as a colleague on our collaborative work. And thank you for your attention. Thanks for the uh, introduction, Liam. So, as as you've described, uh, in 2016 we have presented a new uh, cell isolation technique for isolation of viable uh, mouse cardiomyocytes, but also actually non-cardiomyocyte cells. And this was really a collaborative effort between the University of Birmingham researchers and University of Singapore, and in particular Matt uh, Akers Johnson, who was instrumental to this work. So I'll probably start from the beginning, and I will introduce the fact that the enzymatic cardiomyocyte association uh, using Langendorf was conceived over 40 years ago, and to my knowledge, this is the first report of such an isolation and, and the use of Langendorf apparatus by Michael Berry in Circulation Research in 1970. And really, since then, there's been a, a tremendous expansion of the use of isolated mouse cardiomyocytes in research. So I've just plotted the number of PubMed publications from the 1960s to, to really 2018, and you can really see this exponential growth in the number of papers using mouse cardiomyocytes. There are, of course, problems with Langenhoff isolations, and uh, I've listed some of these here. There is a necessity for the use of commercial or custom-made apparatus, which can be either expensive or difficult to make. There are considerable expertise required because you have to cannulate a small mouse aorta. This requires a lot of training. And of course, there is a requirement for the pre-injection of animals with anticoagulants such as heparin. And from the previous research, we know that this, the heparin itself can be detrimental to downstream PCR-based analysis. And these are just a couple of papers that report to that here. The, uh, there's also, of course, issue with sterility, because trying to sterilize a complex uh, apparatus such as a Langendorf um, is not easy and needs to be done continuously. So we've considered all these problems, and we've decided to develop a simpler methodology for isolation of cardiac myocytes, which relies on the application of a hemostatic aortic clamp, uh, which, and then we would force the buffers through the coronary circulation, uh, which is shown in red here, uh, by effectively putting a syringe into the left ventricle 
and with the aorta clamped, the only way for those buffers to, to go anywhere else would be through the coronary circulation, thus ensuring deep perfusion of the myocardium. This method is published in 2016, as I said, and there has been several labs now that have taken it up. Beyond the uh, innovations in, in, in the methodology itself, in other words, in the principle of uh, the isolation, we've also realized that we need to introduce three key other modifications. The, the first one is that uh, the hearts also rapidly get perfused with a high EDTA buffer. And really the reasoning behind this is to, is to drop calcium straight away whilst the heart is still in, a, in the chest of a mouse. And because we know that, that calcium overload can cause cardiomyocyte death. Another thing that we were a little bit surprised about is but data indicated that the pH of buffers uh, needs to be adjusted to 7.8 and this ensures higher cell survival. And of course, as I've already mentioned, all the buffers are introduced by intraventricular injection, which of course uh, is not particularly expensive, so it, it allows everyone to use this technique in their labs. So I will just take you now uh, through a step-by-step -step guide of the injection method. So the mouse is anesthetized and the chest cavity of the anesthetized mouse, the mouse is open to below diaphragm and uh, which we sort of demonstrate in red here in order to fully expose the heart. And then the first thing that we do is we cut the descending aorta and inferior vena cava whilst the heart is still in the chest of the mouse. And then we come with a syringe into the right ventricle. We inject the EDTA containing buffer uh, and uh, the <clears throat> We inject the EDTA containing buffer into the apex of the right ventricle and we just perfuse the EDTA buffer and immediately you should be able to see that the contractions of, uh, of the heart start becoming attenuated and within well, probably two to three minutes the heart will stop contracting because the calcium is quenched completely. Then we use the Lahi forceps to reach behind the heart to climb the aorta and then heart is removed by cutting the aorta behind the clamp. Next step is to move the clamped heart and submerge it into a, a dish of EDTA containing buffer. And uh, EDTA buffer is then injected into the apex of the left ventricle. And from now on, all the perfusion happens through the left ventricle. So after that, then collagenase buffer is injected again into the apex of the left ventricle until the digestion becomes apparent. And you should really see this because the heart becomes getting pale and it starts becoming quite squishy to use the technical term. And, um, and after normally for adult hearts, we use about 30 to 40 mils of collagenase buffer, whereas for younger hearts, we can even get away with 20 mils. And uh, after that, the clamp is removed. Once the heart is fully digested, uh, the clamp is removed, heart is separated into respective chambers, and then tissue is pulled gently uh, into small pieces using forceps and dissociated by gentle pipetting. So really from, the, from this point on, the, uh, the, the trituration process, so dissociation of tissue, is exactly the same as you would do in a Langendorf, for Langendorf isolation. And the last step is uh, to add the stop buffer. Now, all these buffers, by the way, the, the actual uh, recipes for the buffers you can find in the paper. It's, it's quite a descriptive paper. There's a lot of detail there. And uh, cell suspension then will contain uh, cardiac myocytes, but also non-myocyte cells, and also little pieces of the tissue will then be uh, strained through the 100, micro, 100 micrometer strainer and uh, myocytes will be allowed to settle by gravity for around 20 minutes. So the supernatant will contain the non-myocyte cells, debris and extracellular matrix, uh, whereas the, uh, the, the pellet will contain your cardiac myocytes. After that, we introduce cells to calcium in a stepwise fashion and uh, 
hopefully then after that you will have nice viable cardiac myocytes. I mean, these are some of the images. We, we normally use this technique to isolate ventricular cells and it works really well. We see cardiac myocytes with clearly organized sarcomeric striation patterns. We are also recently started using the technique for atrial cells, even though this is still in its development. Now, I'm not going to take you through all the data that we've generated as part of this work to validate the technique, so I will just give you a quick summary. We have demonstrated the cardiac myocytes isolated using injection technique, retained transcription or functional characteristics, uh, and can be used for all sorts of investigations. So we know we've demonstrated the cardiomyocytes exhibit expected frequency-dependent changes in calcium transients and contractility. We've shown that they can be patch clamped. So in this case, we measured sodium currents. Uh, we've shown that there they can be amenable to a denoviral transfection. We showed that they're responsive to adrenergic stimulation in a dose-dependent manner, and this was done using calcium transient contractility, but also in terms of signaling by looking at phospholamba and phosphorylation. AKT and ERK-1-2. We've also uh, exposed these hearts to pressure overload, and we've seen that that actually results in myocyte hypertrophy, as you would expect, and also on in cardiac myocytes, we've analyzed expression of hypertrophic markers such as AMP, BMP, alfactin, and uh, we've also demonstrated that these myocytes are responsive to hypoxic stress. So as I said, there's, there's a lot of data in the paper and a lot of the groups are now starting to use the te technique. Uh, but what we have also looked at is what is present in the non-myocyte fraction. Now obviously, both Langendorf and injection methods will uh, allow isolation of cardiac myocytes and non-myocytes. But, but here we've actually, in the paper, we have quantified how many percentage-wise smooth muscle cells, there are fibroblasts, there are endothelial and immune-related cells in the uh, non-myocyte fraction, in other words, in the supernatant that we normally tend to dis discard if we're only interested in cardiac myocytes. So these are some of the numbers. Uh, smooth muscle cells, we found that there were 7.5%, fibroblasts were 20.7%, uh, endothelial cells around 20 to 40 cells, depending on what you uh, consider them to be, and then immune-related cells around 26.8%. We've also cultured these cells for uh, quite an extensive period of time and uh, to a full confl confluency, and we found that in really in post-confluent cultures, we've done a lot of staining experiments. We found that we used, for example, the mentin to stain uh, cardiac fibroblasts, which are actually shown in green in the right-hand panel, but we've also stained for uh, endothelial cells and smooth muscle cells, and we found that the, actually in post-confluent cultures, you get these really beautiful endothelial cell networks, which are sort of propagating on top of the, the cardiac fibroblasts. And whilst we haven't really done anything further with this, uh, with this uh, setup and with this work, uh, we, we feel that opens up the field to quite a lot of quite nice experiments. Another thing that we have demonstrated in the paper, and then we're starting to do some of this work ourselves, is that you can co-culture cardiomyocytes and cardiac fibroblasts. So here you can see the cardiac fibroblasts are stained with vimentin, which is shown in red, and the cardiac myocytes with alfactin too, stained in green, and you can get these beautiful looking co-cultures. And obviously it's for the researchers to decide what kind of experiments they want to do with them. So when this paper came out, um, there was an editorial in the circulation research, and um, it was uh, called a new, with or without Langendorf, a new method for adult myocyte isolation to be tested with time. Because obviously changing established protocols such as the Langendorf is not easy. And um, there were a couple of questions that the uh, authors of the editorial asked, and that is that, or statements that, whether it would be effectively used for this method, whether it would be effectively used for isolating myocytes from some diseased hearts, such as, for example, an infarcted heart with large and thin scar that can be easily ruptured, as you're obviously introducing quite a lot of pressure through the left ventricle, whether such a technique would be feasible with infarcted hearts. And also, they've asked for us to do, well, 
us or maybe other people to do some of the direct comparisons between the myocytes isolated with the new method and those cells isolated with the traditional Langdon-based method. So since the publication, we've actually gone on to address some of these questions. So the first question was, question was whether you can isolate viable cardiac myocytes from infarcted hearts which have large and thin scars or would these scars simply rupture due to the pressure they're introducing through the injection method? And uh, here we see, you can see that we've uh, induced a myocardial infarction by left coronary artery ligation in mice that are eight weeks of age. And uh, two weeks later, we have uh, isolated cells from these hearts. You can see a, hopefully a nice uh, region of, of scar formation um, on these hearts. and um, we have quantified the total cell numbers in sham and mi uh, hearts and as you would expect obviously you get fewer cell numbers we've also quantified the percentage of rod shaped cells uh, which is the graph on the right hand side and again as we would expect we get around we get a decrease in the percentage of rod shaped cells in the presence of mi so of course you get fewer cells as you would expect, because you get an infarcted region with cell death in that part of the heart, but you're still able to isolate viable myocytes and rod-shaped cells from these hearts. We've also tried to compare uh, the, I would say, the quality of the cells uh, in terms of function, in terms of signaling uh, that is that are isolated by traditional Langendorf technique, as well as this new injection method. So one of the first things that we looked at is is there any difference in activation of intracellular signaling cascades? So we have isolated cells using Langendorf and injection, and we've compared them for, in this case, the diastolic calcium, which seem to have been the same, as you can see in the top panel, between the Langendorf and injected. Langendorf is shown in white bars, whereas injected uh, injection method is shown in the gray bars. Uh, also, there were no differences in diastolic sarcomere length, there was also no difference in uh, PKC alpha localization. So this was for us a way to assess the percentage of PKC alpha that is found in the cytosol versus membrane. And again, we didn't find that there was more PKC alpha in the membranous fraction with either of the techniques. And we also looked at the Erkwan 2 phosphorylation. And again, there were no significant differences in erkwan quantity phosphorylation between the cells isolated using Langendorf or injection method. Then we've done some functional experiments. So we loaded the cells with a calcium dye, furum, uh, which is, and then recorded calcium transients and sarcomere shortening at different frequencies going from one hertz, to three hertz. And we've looked at diastolic calcium. We've looked at uh, tau, which is calcium decay. We looked at calcium amplitude, sarcomere length, and we really didn't find any differences between the Langendorf and injection. And we found that, that at individual frequencies, they, they behaved in exactly the same manner. So effectively, a healthy cell is a healthy cell. We've also then finally compared the effects of beta stimulation on calcium transient contractility in ventricular cells. And we found that in the presence of ISO, of course, you get an increase in uh, sarcomere length shortening in both cells well, in cells isolated using either method, we found that calcium transient relaxation times were both similar in the presence and absence of ISO, and the calcium transient amplitude increase was similar. So, to summarize, we found, we discovered a, or we've developed a novel injection-based method for isolation of cardiac myocytes that does not rely on Langendorf. This method produces high yields of ventricular and atrial cardiac myocytes. It allows co-culture experiments of cardiac myocytes, fibroblasts, and possibly other cell types in the heart as well. Uh, it can be, uh, it allows successful isolation of cardiac myocytes from infarcted hearts. And we really found when we compared the two methodologies, the Langendorf and injection method, we really found no differences in activation of signaling cascades uh, at baseline or indeed any differences in calcium transient and contractility in terms of frequency dependent responses or indeed in terms of response to adrenergic stimulation. 
So I would like to, of course, acknowledge the people that have contributed to this work, uh, primarily Matthew Akers Johnson, who has been really instrumental in this, and uh, he's based in National University of Singapore, and he's part of Roger, Professor Roger Fu's lab, and you can see Roger, Professor Roger Fu's lab in the top image, obviously, it's Singapore, so it's nice and warm, and I, I've been told apparently this is not how they go to their lab, but this is Roger Fu on the left and Matthew Akers Johnson on the right. And in my lab, um, it, the work has been mainly done by a PhD student, Sean Marie O'Brien, who has just uh, finished her PhD, and uh, uh, Dr. Andrew Holmes on the right, who has actually just taken on a lectureship position at University of Birmingham as well. So I would really like to thank you for the attention and uh, I look forward to answering your questions at the Q&A session. Okay, thanks, Devor, for the great presentation. And with that, we'll jump right into our Q&A session. So to kick things off, here's an appropriate question for you, Devor, following your presentation. Which technique do you think is best for successful cardiomyocyte isolation, Langendorf or the injection method? Well, I mean, as, as you've seen from my presentation um, just earlier on, We've in my lab we we use both techniques actually because some of the projects we historically use Langendorf and therefore continued with it as well to finish finish those projects off. So as a result of that, we compare the two techniques in terms of functional output. And once you get good cells out, um, the functional outputs are no different in terms of signaling, uh, calcium transients, uh, contractility, uh, etc. Which technique give, is more likely to give you? Um, I would say functional cardiac myocytes on a on a sort of day to day basis. In our experience, the injection method tends to be a little bit more successful, but obviously that potentially could be due to just good practice on that technique as well. Perfect. All right. Now we've got a few questions on digestion. Uh, for example, how would one know when the digestion is completed? Wrongly, do you want to lead this one? Yes, of course. So I think to know when the digestion is completed is a lot to do with one's experience. And if you uh, are using an uh, inline uh, pressure transducer for any beginner or flow probe, you actually will know that either the pressure will drop or the flow will increase because the heart is actually become softer. And all the other most common way is really by, you know, uh, kind of a lightly, gently touch uh, the hearts and they will really become very soft to touch and then also a little bit transparent because now uh, they are completely digest. Great. And Devor, do you have anything to add yeah. to that? No, I mean, I would, I would completely agree with that. Um, I, I wouldn't have anything else to add apart from that. Uh, maybe actually I would say just if you're using the injection technique, you would also probably see that the, the, the hole where you're injecting the solution it's uh, getting wider and you might actually get some solution backflow through that hole, again, indicating that the tissue is getting digested uh, and is actually already digested at that point. So, so, but yes, everything that Rongli said, that's exactly how we would judge it as well. Okay, thanks. And another question regarding digestion here, what kind of collagenase cocktail would you recommend? Davor, do you want to lead? Um, so, uh, yes, I mean, we... I've used, I mean, for recently for the injection method, we've used a collagenase cocktail, uh, so collagenase 2 and 4, and we've used 0.5 mg per mil of each. But we have also tried Librase, and that worked quite well. So we've used about uh, around 1, one mg um, of Librase for the digestion uh, using the injection method. Uh, and we always tend to combine it with protease inhibitors as well. So. For example, if you look at the paper, we, we clearly show which batch number to use for collagenases and also which protease to use, so protease 14 in this case and in what concentration. So I would refer to your listeners to, uh, and viewers to, to the paper uh, that we published this uh, technique in. Excellent. That's right. Uh, Rungli and Davor have provided several protocols and suggested publications, which you can find uh, in the resources tab to the right of the media player. So if you're interested in specifics, be sure to check those out. Um, I would probably just add uh, whatever collagenase you choose to use, make sure that you test it out in your system quite well. So what we often tend to do is buy several different batches of collagenases and then 
test out which concentration works best with that particular batch. And once we've identified that, we basically buy a lot of that batch, freeze it, and just keep using it for the next year or so. So the batch, the batch number of the collagenase is quite important. Don't expect just to buy a new collagenase and that it's going to work in exactly the same way that it did before. And this applies to both the Langendorf and the injection method, I would say. All the company will have those test lots for people to try for this yeah, purpose. Yeah. So we usually buy the smalls from whatever their lots. And sometimes we're asking them, seeing which lot has the most stock. And then once we test that group, we actually reserve the entire uh, the, the lot number for it. Mm -hmm. Great. Now, there's another question about reagents and materials. What might be a good culture medium? Devor, maybe you could take this one. Uh, sure. Well, I mean, it, it, it also does depend on what your aims are. I mean, most of us will do short-term culture, maybe one to two days. And uh, in, in, in our experience, really, most culture media will, will sort of give you very similar results. You'll be able to successfully culture cells for, let's say, one to three days. And then after that, you'll see that the um, cell edges are sort of coming in. You'll see loss of T-tubules. Um, and you know, most mostly, then the cells will be unusable. But when we did the, when we did do some of the tests, we found that the M199 worked best. Um, but actually, additions of creatine, uh, carnitine, and taurine didn't really hugely improve our uh, culture well culture success. But having said that, we have also uh, managed to culture cells for quite a long periods of time, for 21 days, in in fact, and you can actually see that data in the paper. Uh, the Akers Johnson paper and published in Circulation Research in 2016. And, and we have used a slightly strange um, concoction. We've used the M199 media, uh, including 0.1% BSA. We've used um, ITS insulin supplements, uh, BDM, contractile inhibitor at 10 millimolar, and then a chemically defined lipid concentrate. But I would say that you know th this is not really a physiological um, experiment that you would be doing because these cells de differentiate and and after 16 17 days they really look unrecognizable they start developing philopodia and um and start even getting some automaticity back so this is more of a fun experiment rather than a, an experiment that i would recommend so culture conditions are one to three days using m199 media perfectly fine Perfect. And now, Rong Lee, uh, what's your experience with uh, kind of best practices for culturing or what culture works the best for you? Um, I think so what Devor just mentioned, uh, I think Zofio is using pretty much a very similar uh, kind of a cocktail with some uh, mm -hmm. maybe personalized for a different experiment set. So, you know, on those culture, we're using DMEM culture, we're using M199. Again, it depends on what experiments uh, you want to do. And typically in our hands, uh, the culture was uh, for rats uh, can be five to seven days, uh, maintain its raw shape, but they were rounded age. Uh, for the mouse, probably somewhere between, you know, uh, three to five day maximum uh, in our experience. Um, again, you know, it really depends on how the quality of the cell, when you isolate to begin with, good quality of cell will tend to be survive longer and poor quality will die, you know, very quickly. Sometimes even cannot survive overnight. Yeah. Oh, okay. No. no, I completely agree with that. Okay, f fantastic. Now, the next question is, how damaging is it to the heart to have a delay between excising the heart and putting it on the Langendorf system? Rung Lee, what's your experience with this? Okay, so this really comes to experience. Uh, when you are first time hanging hearts, you probably will take more than even 10 minutes uh, uh, to really get yourself situated and knowing where's the outer, how high you're going to hang, and all those things. So I generally recommend the people um, before even hanging, do a dissection in the heart. So you know your anatomy of the heart and you know where you're going to hang. For example, you want to hang your cannula just right before the aortic valve. You want to know where's aortic valve so you can have those uh, really, you know, 
knowledge on the anatomy of the heart. So for the first heart, you should take all your time to figure those out. And then, you know, you just follow what you need to do and don't even think about the time and to hang the heart. Uh, you will be surprised few hearts later. It's really hard to not hang in the heart within few seconds. So I think time is in essence. So you want to be as short as the time as possible, but, uh, but at the same time, you also don't want to get that pressure in you because the more you think about, I need to get that into a three second. And the more you think about that way, you're probably going to take, you know, 10 minutes to uh, uh, fiddling around the heart and then not even get it onto cannula. Great. And Davor, when you use the Langendorf method, what's, what do you, uh, what's your experience with this? So, I mean, everything that Rongli said is absolutely right. You know, you, you, you need to minimize the time uh, from the chest to the, to the Langendorf system. Uh, and and the, the faster that goes, the, the better. Um, I would probably say that actually having used both techniques, you know, injection and the Langendorf, I would probably say this is where the injection technique really um, has a lot of benefit because you don't need to cannulate the heart and the perfusion happens pretty much immediately, even when it's, well, essentially even when the heart is in the chest. Um, so so for, the, for the ease of doing the procedure, an isolation procedure, I would definitely divert your uh, viewers to, to the injection method because there is no steep learning curve associated with the cannulation of the heart. But, but yes, absolutely, that timing is crucial either way. Perfect, great answer. Now, next question, does mincing by scissors and trituration by transfer pipette damage or tear the myocytes? Dev, or what's your experience with this? I mean, definitely does, yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, I always make, well, I always try not to um, mince the heart by scissors if I can. I, I hope that the heart is digested enough that I can just uh, pull it apart by, uh, by tweezers and then triturate uh, quite gently. And I tend to introduce BDM into this uh, protocol. So, uh, so yeah, absolutely. I think you can damage the cells by uh, mincing by scissors. So tease it apart with the, with the uh, tweezers and then triturate fairly gently. Rong Lee, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, I completely agree. When the heart is really fully digested, it's almost kind of a, you know, fall apart in front of your eyes. So you can quickly using a teaser and uh, tweezer to really tease apart the tissue and the cell will just come out. And that will be the <clears> best way. Yeah. Perfect. Now, one registrant asked, after isolation, we obtained cardiomyocytes with good survival. However, when they're added to a medium with the smallest amount of calcium, they die. How do you avoid that? Rong Lee, do you want to lead this one? Great question. So actually, if this happened, this is actually the sign telling you that those myocytes uh, you isolate are overdigest and they already with some membrane damage. So then when the calcium adds into it, uh, you will immediately see them kind of uh, in the going to contracture or going to uh, board it up. So I think uh, this you have to go back to maybe reduce the time of your digestions or will reduce slightly uh, enzyme uh, concentrations. I think try and error a couple of times and then um, and observe what you got and take notes on every time you make changes and then you will see the improve. And I always recommend people to do on purpose to do shorter time to see what the under digest heart look like and to longer time to see what over digest heart look like. And you sort of kind of find your own timing in between that under and over. It's what you are perfect uh, sweet spot there. Perfect. And Devor, do you have anything to add to that? No, I mean, I think that's, that's a great answer and I, and I fully agree. And, and the only thing I would add to this is that um, under digestion and over digestion are clearly two different sides of the spectrum. But actually, for different techniques, they are equally important. So, for example, if you want to patch the cells, um, then you know do patch clamp studies on them. You may actually want to underdigest them uh, because that might make it easier for you to to patch clamp the cells. So, so it really does also depend on what experiments you want to do afterwards. 
um, and that will sort of decide which side of the spectrum of digestion you're, you're on effectively. But yeah, I, I agree with everything that Ron Lee said prior to this as well. So, Great, great answer. Now, next question uh, is, what is your success rate for the protocol you use uh, for a solution of viable cardiomyocytes suitable for downstream functional assays? Davor, do you want to take this one? Uh, sure. So, I mean, the rate of success um, or the number of live cells, you know, that you can judge the success of an experiment by one or the other. Um, you, you want every time you do an experiment, you, every time you want to, you do an isolation, you want the, the isolation to work. So if you're asking me, what is the success rate? Um, so in other words, that we get some cells every single time. Uh, with the injection method, I would say that that's a higher success rate than with the Langendorf, at least in my lab. Uh, and that's probably because Langendorf system uh, is is trickier to clean. It's um, it, it takes longer from the heart to the to the cannulation. But um, that's our experience with that. But on the percentage, on the number of live cells. Um, Again, we find that there is a slight benefit of using the injection system, injection system, uh, injection isolation. Um, so, I would therefore say the number of live cells tends to be around sixty percent or something like that. Um, that's kind of what the yield that we get is normally. Fantastic. And wrongly, what's the success rate like in your experience? So. I think in our experience with uh, has been a large number of fellows and research assistants whom we have trained in the past. I would say, you know, once you got good at that, in average, I think uh, greater than 85% of the cells should be viable and high quality with any subsequent experiments. So I just want to, you know, uh, highlight that to make sure the cell it's in good shape before you proceed with any of your print experiments. And you really take time to learn and master the technique. And I think patient is virtual. So be patient and, you know, practice, make perfect. And it is important to know um, garbage in, garbage out. So <laughs> don't do the experiments unless you know you do have, you know, at the best of your judgment, you have a good viable cell. And, but also don't wait for a miracle uh, to happen either. Again, I will reiterate, practice make perfect and you will learn from your own experience. And I think that's probably, it's the best way. Uh, you can learn from other people to tell you and other people's experience, that's great. But you still need to, you know, go down, get your hand wet and doing it and learn from your own experience and then improve on that and talk to people. Okay, and a good follow-up question is, Rongli, how do you tell if your cells are good quality? So the cell in high quality, it's probably even in the calcium solution, uh, they should be quiescent and it's not spontaneously twitching or jiggling. If those cells doing that in the calcium solution, that means their membrane has a slightly damage. So you actually calcium overload in some way. So then you will see the cells that, you know, twitching and jiggling. And sometimes you can even see almost a calcium wave pass, pass around in, in the myocyte surface. You can see that. Okay, great. And Davor, do you have anything to add to that? No, no, no. I think I think that's absolutely right. Um, and you know, I, everything that Wrongly has said, that's exactly what we would uh, what we would think uh, is the best way to judge it. And and actually, possibly just um, I think I know that Wrongly mentioned this previously to me uh, is just try and pace them. And uh, if they can pace, then that means that often, and they can follow pacing, that means they tend to be of good quality. So. Fantastic. Now, in the interest of time, we're just going to have one more question here, and it's kind of uh, a good general or summary question. But if you had to name one thing or just a few things, what would be your best tricks for successful cardiomyocyte isolation? Rongli, maybe we'll start with you. I think every step is very important. So it's really diff hard to say just one step. So for successful preparation, I think in this case is a begin with hanging the heart correctly at the right position relative to cannula. 
and make sure no air bubble went into the perfusion system and the other is just follow uh, different uh, uh, buffer uh, transitions and for the digestion. Perfect. Now, Devor, for the Langendorf system uh, tips, do you have anything to add to that or maybe any for the injection method? Uh, so, so, I mean, you know, it's, this is, a, as we've sort of established earlier, there's not a single trick that you can use. Um, there's no shortcuts, I think, particularly for the Langendorf um, system. Um, I, I think you've just got to be very careful, as Rongli says, uh, pay attention to every part of the process and uh, make sure that you've you've um, taken the heart as quickly out, make sure that you've uh, cannulated it correctly, make sure there are no air bubbles in there, um, make sure that there is, um, you know, collagenase concentrations are optimized, trituration is done gently, you don't use scissors to cut them up. So I think all these things are quite relevant uh, for the Langendorf. And for the injection, I would probably again say, uh, I would point your, your viewers and readers to the paper, which is very, very detailed and descriptive. And also obviously to contact either Rongli or myself if, uh, if they have any other questions, because I'm sure that we're both quite happy to, to help other people out with this uh, problem. So I want to just add one more thing. I completely agree with uh, Devor what she, he just said, and I, you know, concur that our laboratory will also open uh, to uh, for anyone want to visit and to learn. And I want to actually share one thing. I think people, particularly the beginner, think this is a very daunting task, and it's no way know how they can do it. But so far. We have trained a lot of people, mm -hmm. including in my laboratory, outside my laboratory, and our record is 100%. No one actually failed fail to learn how to isolate a good cardiomyocyte. So there's a hope out there, and don't think you cannot do it. Uh, if you talk to people and practice, I think everyone can do this right.